We, the natural gingers of the world, hereby declare the following principles as part of the forthcoming revolution. We strive for a ginger utopia, a world where red-headed people not only are not ostracized and ridiculed, but where our tonal superiority is envied and celebrated. Our status and privilege shall be great and abundant. We exist without skin color, eye color, nationality, religion, creed, sex, or class. We do not discriminate on this basis. We are bonded through our hair color alone, which should be natural and true. The ginger leg legitimacy and purity of our people is vital to its longevity. Therefore, it is important, where possible, for gingers to procreate with other gingers. <laughs> it is crucial to avoid contamination. <laughs> this is the ginger, ginger Manifesto, and I'm Anthea, and I collect gingers. <laughs> this title of collector most definitely alludes to some kind of crazy, obsessive, compulsive person. Someone who collects boxes of stamps, butterflies, or even worse, gingers. So what does it mean to collect gingers? Well, for an almost three-year period, I methodically, and most definitely crazily and obsessively, photographed 500 red-headed men, men, women, and children locally and abroad. As an artist, my initial interest in photographing gingers came from an aesthetic appreciation of the unique and romantic color palette of a redhead. It was also an exploration of self, looking at an aspect of my own identity and creating a sort of self-portrait. I started doing research into the historical, literary, his biblical and mythical representations of redheads and the stereotypes that emerged from those and now exist in present day. What stereotypes do you think of when you think of a redhead? Well, gingers are said to be stubborn, fiery, tempestuous, passionate and sexual. Historically, their characters have been contentious. They have often been portrayed as madmen, traitors, temptresses, even demons and vampires. In the 15th century, witches, uh, redheads were thought to be witches and thousands were burnt at the stake. In recent years in popular media, there have been many skits and parodies around the contentious nature of redheads. I'm sure we've all seen at least one of these. In the Catherine Tate show, gingers are sent to a ginger refugee camp because they are no longer safe in the outside world. An MIA music video depicts gingers as victims that are brutally abducted and murdered. In South Park, the gingers are initially victims, but they rise up and become oppressors and try to eradicate all the non-gingers around them. These seemingly humorous, yet satirical references were very influential on the tone that I wanted my work to have. It was only after my first shoot with my first seven gingers that this this project began to take its current form. My time management was really bad, and instead of the gingers coming one after the other, they all ended up being there at the same time. This group of strangers who had only one thing in common started sharing similar stories and experiences of being a redhead, both positive and negative. For instance, being at a shopping mall and having old grannies coming to touch our hair, going to the hairdresser and being told, you can't get this color out of a bottle, or not being able to go in the sun for more than two minutes without SPF 1,000 on and still getting burnt, or being asked if we're Scottish or Irish. These stories, no matter how mundane they were, were told verbatim. We also endured the same name calling. I'm always hesitant to mention these names for fear of perpetuating them, so these na this is not an invitation to use them, please. I'm instantly regretting this. <laughs> it was from this initial experience that I started to notice a very obvious and inherent sense of community and collective experience amongst the otherness of the gingers. It was at this point that the red color of their hair became invisible. I started to question, what defines a group of people, a race, 
a nation, a community? Is it genetics? Is it a shared experience, physical appearance, lineage, or facing similar prejudices? It was with these notions in mind that I started doing research into different systems of classification, systems of separation, of inclusion and exclusion. Particular systems that are relevant to my own personal histories of being Jewish and South African are those used during the Holocaust and apartheid. Based on the concept of eugenics, both oppressors desired and implemented, albeit with different methods, structures to ensure racial purity. They intended on keeping uncontaminated what they thought was a superior race. Hitler called this the Ubermensch, or Superman. They wanted to separate the good from the bad. I started to ask myself, what if gingers could be a race of their own? What if gingers could take over the world? And what if this ginger utopia could become a reality? In order to cause a revolution, I would need to collect as many gingers as possible. I would need to empower this minority group that is only 2% of the world population. I would also need to do something about the fact that the ginger gene is a recessive gene. Some even say it's dying out. So, if two gingers have a child, it is almost 100% guaranteed that the child will be a redhead. So, can you see my master plan forming? <laughs> Any single ginger men out there? By the way, this is a real ginger family that I use for my example, so that's pretty cool, I think. And so, my search to collect thousands of gingers began. Like the obsessive collector that I referred to earlier, I spend many hours and much effort sourcing the gingers for my archive. For my first hundred subjects, I would literally stalk people in bars, clubs, doctor's rooms, and on the street. The word of mouth started to spread, and people started to collect gingers for me. After all, everyone has at least one token ginger friend, right? <laughs> I thought so. I, I, even I, I guarantee you that after this talk, you will become super aware of the gingers around you, and please, when you do, send them my way to be collected. In interviewing all the gingers that I photographed, I learned that many of them had a very difficult time growing up, were ostracized, ridiculed, and made to feel different. But now, they wanted to publicly celebrate their gingerness. I even had non-gingers trying to convince me of their supposed gingerness. They would say, my hair looks a little bit red in this kind of light, or I've got a little bit of ginger in my beard, can I be a part of this? It was really interesting to me how people wanted to be a part of this elite collection that I had created. Early on in the project, I set myself a midterm goal of photographing 500 gingers for my first solo exhibition, which took place at Circa Gallery in January this year. However, 500 now seems a pittance compared to the thousands large database I've managed to grow. I get emails almost daily from people from all over the world asking to be collected. I managed to grow my national network to a global level when I attended the Redhead Day in the Netherlands in September of 2012. <laughs> in the small town of Breda, I was surrounded by thousands of gingers. It was beautiful, strange and surreal. I felt like I was in a science fiction movie, something out of Gattaca, perhaps. It was a snippet of this ginger utopia that I had imagined. The hundreds of ginger portraits begin to narrate this ginger utopia. The close-up, full frontal, and unsmiling portraits are reminiscent of identity photos or mugshots. The images are stark, with white backgrounds, white shirts, and even lighting. The portraits are not meant to emphasize the individuality of the subjects, but rather they emphasize the collective. They highlight the sameness and uniformity of gingerhead people. Each portrait is classified into a category ranging from strawberry blonde to dark auburn. When I started imagining what this world governed by gingers would look like, I realized that there would always be a need to create some kind of hierarchy. There would always be this idea that I am more ginger than you. It seems to be human nature, really. 
My classification system is pseudoscientific, much like the infamous pencil test and nose measuring test used during apartheid and the Holocaust, respectively. I decided on a purely visual basis who should be a part of which subgroup. Additional elements to the project which act as satirical subtexts to this imagined narrative that I created and in my mind elevate the project beyond a purely aesthetic portrait series include the Manifesto of Gingers, which you can find online <laughs> to read in full, a history of gingers, and ginger identity cards. <laughs> you can see there there's a strand of hair on the card. I collected a piece of hair from every person that I photographed. I have a file full of hairs. <laughs> <laughs> Speak about obsessive compulsive. It is my belief that it is human nature to create separation and difference. We have gone through really traumatic histories of racism, homophobia, and anti-Semitism. Those isms are now taboo. They aren't often spoken about or discussed in a comfortable manner. We have discriminated on the basis of skin color, nationality, religion, and sexual preference. What's left? Hair color? Is gingerism perhaps the last acceptable form of prejudice? Is hair color that different from skin color? After all, both are genetic and pigment-based manifestations. Both seem a ridiculous basis on which to discriminate. I am not saying that the prejudice that gingers experience can be equated to those that have ended in unequal rights, apartheid, or even genocide. Ginger hair becomes a placeholder, a symbol, a metaphor, to deal with these very real and still prevalent notions. I collect gingers to explore what defines a group of people, a race, a nation, a community. What makes us different or the same, superior or inferior, included or excluded, excluded. But most importantly, I collect gingers to, rise, to fight against ginger discrimination and to rise up and become the master race they are intended to be. Thank you.